for today are Joanna Bannerman, who's the Managing Director of Access Bank Zambia, Lindy, Lindy Farisani, Head of Equity Advisory Sales at UBS Investment Bank South Africa, Sylvia Mulinge, Chief Customer Officer Safaricom Kenya, and Charles Mudiwa, CEO Stanbic Bank. Now, when we look at our fellow panelists who are here with us, and we look at leadership across the continent, I think we can say that we have a lot of celebrated leaders here in Africa, from presidents like Ellen Johnson Sirleaf to Nobel Prize winners like Wangare Maathai, business leaders like Strive Masiiwa, and country community builders and world best teacher Peter Tabichi. All of these leaders empower, inspire, and bring people around a common vision. Our panelists themselves are leaders in their organizations and in their countries. And in this panel, I want us to take the opportunity to gain insight from them on how we can truly drive organizational performance through transformational leadership. So as you listen to this uh, conversation, dear audience, please feel free to post any questions or comments in the chat. And I'll try to take those um, in the Q&A session uh, once we've had our opening conversation with our panelists. So to kick us off, if I could ask Charles, Charles, from your perspective, what is transformational leadership? That's a very interesting discussion to have and transformational leadership, as uh, most people think about, is about somebody who takes out a, almost going in a, if I call it a, a different path and transforms and changes the current environment. In our current environment where we're sitting today, you almost can call it disruptive as well in many ways in the sense that it changes the way things are done and creates a new path and charts a new course of action. But it also has another part, which is that it also has a clarity of vision and purpose in terms of where they're going and also inspires people to come along and to join in that journey. Now, there are a couple of pointers that are important for us to talk about transformational leadership and what that leadership should be about. The first thing is that it's purpose-driven. There has to be a very clear purpose about where you want to be. And Nuru, when she was speaking earlier on and spoke about Martha and Mary, she spoke about activity versus a purpose and vision versus activity. And, and I think it's an important point that as leaders, you actually are purpose driven and are seeking to achieve something. Um, I was reading a House of Commons report the other day about a bank failure in the UK called Ashboss many years ago. And they wrote this statement, which I thought was very profound. They said it is the epitome if you want to call it a failure, when process drives purpose. And a lot of us as leaders find ourselves in a situation where we're driven by activity and process rather than by purpose. And therefore, transformational leadership is about driving purpose and being clear about that purpose. The second thing is that it's about seeking significance, not success. And, and that's an important part about this, that you actually are clear about being significant. And being significant means that you create a legacy. You create something that is long term, that is enduring, that actually outlives you. And as people always say, some people die once and they're forgotten, and some people never die because when they're buried, their works and lives live after them. But some of us who die get buried, we do 40 days of um, remembrance, and thereafter, no one even talks about you. And therefore, being significant means that you build something that's enduring, long lasting. And that's what transformational leadership is about. But it's also about building disciples. It's also about being able to create a team of disciples. I mean, if you go biblical, Jesus built a whole team of disciples. That's part of being transformational. People who believe in you, who die for you, who sacrifice for you, but more importantly, who are prepared to communicate and take the message forward. Because as a leader, you're not going to be there to do everything every day. And you need to have strong disciples who are there to support you. Fourthly, it's about courage. And it's about being able to make, take risks and being able to go out there. And the important piece about courage is that a lot of us are afraid to do things or to take risks. And we're afraid what community think about. And um, this being a women conference, one of the things that I encourage my women executives is that be bold out there and go out and do it. And we should not worry about what community will think about us, but actually go out and do it and be courageous, be decisive and execute on it. And yes, mistakes will be made, but that's fine. That's part of the learning that you need to do. And then number four, it's also about constantly learning. It's about intellectual stimulus. It's about you wanting to learn, understand everything else 
and doing things the way you want to do them and being able to say what is the new thing about town what can i do and how do i go say learn and learning real learning and learning it's a never ending stage particularly in this fuga time we have to learn and learn, learn new things and then we must tell our stories i mean be able to share your stories and be able to say this is what i've achieved this is what it is because a lot of us get inspired by hearing stories i mean there's an african proverb that says until the lion tells his story tales of hunting will always favor the hunter and until you tell your story tales of of, of, of success and leadership will always favor the other person who is writing the story so it's about telling your story and being able to say this is what we've done and most organizations thrive on stories i mean i was in disney the other day and i went to the back office and we were in a leadership program and they had said that this big thing that said this company was born by a rat and you all know the rat mickey mouse and they tell the story of mickey mouse like actually that rat actually lives but they always tell about it and they innovate and innovate and mickey mouse is in two time and they've innovated around that rat like something else but we all think about mickey mouse we forget it's a rat but that's actually what innovation is about and that's what transformation is about and creating something from nothing and that actually makes people want to believe that and therefore if you look about what transformation leadership about it's about all those things and being able to create significance creating a new path and a vision being purpose driven being courageous being of course like i said learning and constantly telling a story and the last thing i want to say about this is that we need to be very clear about this that we must run the meeting so if you're going to be a transformational leader you don't just set the agenda i know people typically talk about setting the agenda but the principle i want us to leave today is to say whoever runs the meeting sets the agenda it's not the other way around you can set the agenda and walk away and the meeting turns out to be very different from the agenda but if you run the meeting then you're setting the agenda and for women in particular i will say yes for us as a conference it's us for this conference and talk about things but what is more important is to say when are we going to run the meeting and if we're not allowed on that meeting let's set up our own meeting if you're not allowed on the table build your own table run the meeting then you said that Jim. thank you very much for that charles um there's a lot of uh, wonderful nuggets from there and i can see that the chat is going uh, crazy i think people really liked the 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 relation you made between the lion and the hunter and who actually uh, tells the story of success thank you and there's something that you mentioned which i think is very important when you talk about purpose driven and vision and i'd just like to bring in joanna um from your perspective and your leadership journey of course now you're with um, access bank what is your view of your own leadership style i think that's uh, one thing to ask how does it drive you and building on what charles said earlier how do you get your organization to align behind your vision? Thank you so much, Susan. And, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me to this very power packed uh, conference. Um, I'd like to write on the protocols that have been earlier established. Um, well, so to talk about my leadership style, um, I, I agree with uh, Dr. John Maxwell that everything rises and falls on leadership. So, and as far as I'm concerned, at the heart of leadership is people. How those people can be inspired and motivated to see the big picture of where an organization wants to go or what it wants to be. How those people buy into that big picture and align to it to deliver the desired results for the organization. My leadership style is largely collaborative. So it's a mix of democratic and strategic leadership, but predominantly it's coach style. I believe in people. I believe in building strong teams and uh, raising leaders within those teams. So I tend to encourage people to challenge themselves and I tend to identify strengths within the individuals in my teams and nurture those strengths to improve generally the performance of the teams. I believe so much in people that I invest time, energy, and resources to help them identify their strengths, improve on their weaknesses, improve upon themselves generally in whatever way, shape, or form, and also to align to 
um, positive work culture um, and, and, and things, things like that. Now, this approach means that you, I have to get involved in the lives of people. This approach of being a coach um, in, in, in your leadership style. Um, so you get involved in their lives, you understand them, try to find out what makes them tick, empathize, advise, support, etc. I know that sounds like a lot of work, but it's very rewarding to see the kind of growth, confidence, camaraderie, and improved performance that comes with this leadership style. And believe it or not, it has, it has served me very well over the years. Um, the next, um, the next uh, question is what drives me? Um, my personal philosophy is what drives me. And my personal philosophy is actually anchored on three principles. The first is that whatever your hands find to do, do it to the best of your ability. As far as I'm concerned, that's the best way to sleep well at night. Because once you've given it your all, once you've done everything that you ought to do, one, you have real cause to celebrate when it works out. And um, two, it helps to bring up, sometimes you find that you look back and you wonder, wow, did I do that? I didn't even know that I had that strength or that ability in me. And it's when you give it your all that you come to sometimes find that aha moment. But also, once you've given it your all, if it doesn't work out the way you expected or the outcome is not what you expected or it, didn't, it doesn't quite end the way um, it was planned, at least you will know that it was not because you did not try. And I think that gives you peace of mind and you sleep well. The other thing that drives me is that if you are not faithful in that which is another man's, or if you are not faithful in that which belongs to somebody else, you will not get your own. Whatever you define your own to be, <clears throat> your own may be a dream job, it may be a big position, it may be your own business, but if you have not learned to be entrepreneurial about somebody else's business, it becomes difficult to get your own. So be entrepreneurial about the job you have. Yes, you may be just an employee, but you must be faithful. Um, have ownership, treat it as your own. You'll be surprised that in that process, you develop attributes and skills that can move you to the next level. And what's even the bonus in all of this is that whatever you have built, whatever skills you have learned or built, no one can take it away from you, even if you leave or when you leave that organization. The third and, and, and last principle that drives me on a daily basis is that when the grass is looking greener on the other side, get out your own water hose or watering can and water your own lawn or your own grass. Work on yours and get it to become green or greener. So instead of salivating over other people's green grass and feeling sorry for yourself, let it motivate you to improve upon yourself and improve upon your work. So these uh, basically drive me on a, on a daily basis. Do the best you can, be faithful. And if something is not working on you, see that somebody is doing something that is good, try to improve upon yourself. The last thing, um, the last question is how to, do we get alignment um, to the vision in, in, within our organization? This is a very, very important um, thing for every organization, getting staff to buy into the vision. So at Access Bank, one thing we do is that we recite our corporate philosophy before every meeting. Now that our corporate philosophy encompasses our vision, our mission, and our core values. Because first we believe that staff must even know what the vision is. They must know it. Secondly, they must understand it if they are to align. So um, to understand it, we run a lot of training sessions on our corporate philosophy. 
we explain what the vision is and we also try to show the benefits of aligning to the vision not only professionally but also in our personal lives so once our staff know understand and buy into the vision and this and once they also see how it impacts them positively both professionally and and in private life alignment is easy and it's achieved within our organization thank you so much thank you joanne for that i think it was very insightful um, I see people really uh, appreciated the metaphor that you gave of, the, of watering your own lawn. There's something really important there um, about um, taking ownership for your, for o your own remit, um, taking ownership for the, for the resources, the roles, etc. that you've been given within an organization to really grow that because whatever you do later, that's going to help you. And like you said, no one can take it away from you, something that you've been able to, to build for yourself. So I think that was uh, super insightful. Thank you for that. I'll turn now to um, Sylvia uh, Mulinge. Sylvia, I think, you know, it was said earlier today um, when we opened the, the, the conference, this has been a year like no other. And um, we'd like to ask you the question, you know, when you look at, when you look at this year and when you look at your your own leadership style. How do you think COVID is going to change effective leadership? And how do you think COVID has changed the way you lead? Thank you very much. Really happy to be here and uh, bless morning to everyone. So um, I think from my side, first of all, first, for all of us who are privileged to be called leaders, um, or in, in whichever way, whether you're leading in a corporate organization, or you're even leading as a mother in your own family or a leader in your community. Um, I think the first point is just to have an, an, an understanding that leadership is a, a point and a position of privilege. And that's something that I learned um, in a course that I did a while back where a lady called uh, Angie Moranga, um, where we spoke about uh, and learned a lot about purpose-driven leadership. And therefore, when you find yourself um, in moments like this, uh, where there's um, what is called crisis, right? Like what uh, has uh, uh, we have seen uh, going through because of uh, COVID. I think the question to ask yourself is, what is it that you want to propagate uh, to your team? What is the kind of leader that you want to be um, in this season? Um, and how do you want uh, to come out of this? I think what I have learned is that many times we find that uh, moments of crisis such as this normally uh, present opportunities for us to be able to, be, to think about what the future could be, reimagine the current context we find ourselves in. Uh, because obviously with the disruption that we have faced, uh, I have heard words like VUCA. There's so much volatility. We do not know where the next change is coming from. There are so many factors uh, that are constantly changing. Um, there's so much uncertainty and uh, we are not sure about what the next day is going to hold. It is important then to begin to ask what is the mix of, of the leadership ingredient mix that I need to bring to the table to not only, first of all, um, be resilient as an individual, because as leaders, we are called to be leaders of people. Uh, they draw their emotional energy from us. They are looking for us to set the path, to steer them uh, in the situation that they find themselves in. And you cannot lead people if, first of all, you do not have the discipline to be able to lead yourself. We all know that our teams draw their emotional energy from us. So if our energies are not at the right level, then we might end up leading our people in the wrong direction. So first of all, I think it starts from, uh, first of all, spending time with yourself in times of crisis like this, uh, gathering uh, maybe from a point of uh, reflection, from a point of leaning back on what you have learned from the experiences that you've had in the past, and coming up with an ingredient mix that will then propel you uh, during this season that you find yourself in. Now, we all lead uh, in different ways, as I said earlier, and therefore I would not try to pretend and say that there's one leadership kind of uh, success metrics that I probably would recommend to everyone. But what I can do is that I can share with you based on my own journey and based on what I have seen uh, work for me. 
key things that um, have, have really uh, helped me uh, during this season is first of all, uh, spending a lot more time in terms of thinking about uh, what are my daily routines and what is it that I'm feeding myself with. Because if I'm not feeding myself with a diet that is rich in creating a positive mindset, then it becomes very difficult to navigate in a world that has been propagating a lot of negative information. So wherever it is that you draw that positive energy from, whether it is from your faith, from those who are people of faith, whether it is from the people that you interact with, whether it is from what you read or what you allow yourself to have access to, it's important to pay attention to what is your daily routine because that then kind of ferments uh, the possibilities that could probably exist in your mind as you develop that ingredient mix that then will lead uh, the teams out of uh, where you find yourself in. Now, once you kind of get yourself together and you're disciplined in terms uh, of leading yourself. Then the next thing is to ask, how then do I provide the clarity that is required from uh, my team? I think what COVID has also brought to us is that we have been operating with a lot of constraints. Now, those constraints are different from different people in different industries. Uh, if you're working in an organization like Netflix or you're working for Zoom, your constraints have probably been around how do we try to keep up with the demand uh, of a service due to uh, the changing circumstances that we found ourselves in that has required for us uh, to be able to increase uh, our level of supply to be able to match the demand. If you're working in an industry, for example, uh, like in tourism or in the airline industry, your constraints are very different because the kind of challenges you're facing are very different. So you then need to ask, um, what then do we need uh, to do uh, for our organization in the season and the times that we find ourselves in to be able to navigate? Now, your team are looking up to you to provide the clarity that is required, right? So having that clarity of thought is very critical. And especially in these times that we are all working online, um, in Safaricom, we say we are apart, yet we are not alone. How do we ensure that we're able to leverage the tools that we have to be able to provide that clarity and create the energy around your teams that is important to uh, help them achieve that clarity of purpose uh, that you're trying to drive. Now, generating energy is not easy uh, because remember, I, I think one of the things I, I personally have learned is that um, when we shifted to this new way of working, and, and, and to be quite honest, I think the way we work going into the future now has permanently, permanently been redefined. Uh, I can see many of us now are logging in probably from our homes. Uh, this is probably not something we would have done before if we had had uh, this conference, we probably had had it, would have had it in a very different format. So work has been refined. Now, beginning to think about how do you then energize your teams to be able to operate in this different working environment then becomes very critical. And then figuring out, even as you're trying to energize them, the constraints that they're operating at, first of all, at a personal level, the constraint that they are work operating from the space they are in, the constraint that they may be operating in, in terms of even just interacting with the, uh, the technology itself. How do you overcome those constraints? Because leaders must become masters in making choices. Those choices help you to define the clarity. That clarity then helps you to figure out what then do I need to energize my teams? And then how then do I become very real and aware of the constraints that are around me and become a champion as a leader of overcoming those constraints? It would be foolhardy to, uh, for any leader to begin to think that I am not operating in a world of constraint. And I think COVID has really demonstrated that to us. I personally, in my own uh, way, I'm, I'm very passionate um, about lead leading from a very authentic space. And what I normally do is that based on the experiences that I have personally gone through, or what I have seen work for me, I allow that to overflow and share that with the rest of my team because I realize that people are more than a resource. It's about the spirit that your people have that will help you to determine whether you'll be able to come out of any crisis that you find yourself in uh, successfully. So one of the things that I changed was uh, I figured we were all apart. How do I bring everyone online in a way that allows us to keep engaged but not engage, not necessarily in work mode style, because we, we have all found ourselves now working extra long hours because of work. But leverage another platform. I'm passionate about fitness. I saw a joke somewhere online one day that said, we were all sent to work from home, but we are not sent to work from home and live in the fridge. So we got to have conversations around how do we overcome this challenge of adding pandemic because everybody, you're working in, in your dining, you're next to your fridge. So we are all eating too much. So we embraced 
fitness as a platform and leverage that to try and drive energy around the team and begin to create um, uh, changes in our language, in our rituals, around not only just working out, but beginning to say that impossible is nothing. And we could actually prove that and bring that alive using the platform of fitness. And that worked brilliantly for us. I lead a team of about uh, three, 4,000 people, and we had over 2,000 subscribing to that for about eight, nine weeks. And that really helped to kind of turn around the energy of the team during this time. So I think to everyone, depending on the age group of people that you lead, the backgrounds that they come from, the culture of your organization, what can you do? Remember as a leader, especially as a leader in the C-suite, remember that, that look at that C as something that says that you're a curator of the culture that will get your organization to propel itself out of the current crisis that it's finding, it finds uh, itself in. I think the last thing is also to have then a very once you've figured out how do you drive that resilience how do you create the right culture how do you overcome uh the constraints and be that champion of constraints is then what is then the growth mindset that you create for yourself and your team it is a challenging time but i think for myself uh and one of the things that i choose to believe is that the collective future that we face is so much better than the hardships that we have of today if you can't stand from that mind from that perspective and having that mindset then it will become very difficult for you to see a positive future for yourself for your team for your organization for your business for your family right we must all rise above the, uh, the challenges um, that are said today because our challenges do not define us yes we have faced adversity we have found ourselves in the teeth of adversity but there's opportunity for us to be able to create success if we begin to look at that which has been very familiar to us in a very unfamiliar way and begin to ask how do we change how do we change how we do our business how do we change our operating model how do i change even how i lead myself how do i change my daily routines now that i find myself working from home if we begin to confront that which is familiar with a very unfamiliar look and feel then you will begin to find that in that daily practice that daily routine you will begin to navigate a path that will help you to create that transformation that you seek for yourself for your organization for your family or whatever place of leadership that you have been privileged to be in great thank you so much i think um the main thing for me that i'm gonna take out of that is um you know the the know yourself i think like you said this time has really had us self-reflecting a lot on uh, what are our daily habits what are we eating how are we building our energy because importantly like you highlight it's it's really hard to fill from an empty cup so we've got to be able to really channel that energy for ourselves to be able to channel um, as leaders the same sort of energy and momentum to our teams um, I'll invite Lindy now um, to please uh, help us uh, with this particular question um, from your perspective as a as a woman leader what is it that you feel women do well as leaders and also how could we be more effective as women leaders in organizations I will start, if I may, uh, with the second question because it's one that I've been thinking about uh, quite a lot. And um, I think it's one also that a lot of the panelists have touched upon and that is on effective leadership. When I looked at this question, I mean, I went through a series of um, bullet points where I was like, be bold, be um, you know, create your own meetings, be there, make sure that you arrive on time, make sure that you are outspoken and all those things that we've heard over time about how to be effective as leaders. But one thing that I started to think about, about when I was thinking about my journey and how I got to be here and how I became an effective leader was that I became true to myself. And it was actually, it took me a long time to become true to myself and to recognize who it is that I am. When I first started working, I was so concerned about what other people thought of me. I was concerned about fitting in with the guys. I am the only woman in the office, or the only leading woman in the office. Everyone else is mostly supporting staff, so it, it does become very lonely. 
Um, and in addition to that, I also have quite a lot of racial dynamics to deal with in the sense that um, I am a minority of my race, uh, despite being in the African continent, um, given the legacy of apartheid. Um, so when I started working, I remember not, not, not knowing who I was, but trying to figure out how I fitted in to the system. So, you know, I would bring out the, the more whiter part of my experience to the office and leave behind the black part of my experience because I felt, oh no, no one wants to hear about, you know, what we black people do culturally or what we eat, what we enjoy, what we like doing during the weekends. Uh, no one cares about that. This is a white environment. I need to play golf. I need to be polished. I need to be all those things and even more um, while also performing at the best of my level. Soon thereafter, I realized that that was actually a hindrance to my performance. I was not becoming effective, not even though I was not a leader at that point, but just as an employee. I was not standing out. No one was recognizing who I was. My skills were not coming through. My voice was not coming through. So when we think about effective leadership as women in particular, for me, the most important thing is not only knowing who you are, but bringing who you are to the office. If you like pink shoes, if you like, you know, if there's something that you particularly enjoy, bring it with you, obviously within the dynamics and the constraints of the, of the working environment. But we spend so much time, especially as women, trying to restrain who we are, holding back our passions, holding back our sense of self, holding back the things that make us laugh, the things that make us happy, because we think the environment wants us to be a certain way. However, you cannot live your life, especially when you spend so much time at the office, trying to hide such a huge part of yourself. If you love fashion, if you love um, African food, if you love whatever it is that makes you tick, you need to bring it to your work environment. And it's the only way that you will start owning who you are. And you'll be very surprised, especially in an environment where we're dealing with customers, where we're dealing with broad marketplaces, you'd be very surprised at how many people you find on the other side who identify with who you are and therefore come to the table. I've been man I've managed to close deals and in certain transactions just because I started talking about, you know, my passions in an in a meeting environment. Sometimes it's not about what you know, it's not about your education. We all have qualifications but who are you and how do you bring your sense of being to the office? And I think that's one of the most important things that we need to be effective leaders. What that does also, not only does it bring you, but it also helps the people that are around you. So suddenly you've got your followers or rather your colleagues who also see that, oh, I'm allowed to be who I am and can also bring themselves to the office. And you have a dynamic environment. You have an environment where everybody's open. You have an environment in which people feel that they can come to you when they have certain problems, that they don't have to pretend to be people that they're not. Um, and I, for me, that is, that is so important. Um, and I even tell my you know people that I mentor that if you don't bring yourself, if you don't bring the passions and the things that drive you to the office, you will soon face burnout. You will soon forget what it is that you're doing in life because you you're spending so much time trying to be somebody else. Um, so that would be how I would answer um, the first part of the question. Um, and then the second part of the question, I think you asked about um, what do women do well as managers? I think one of the things that we do well as managers is um, our sense of empathy. And once again, I'm going to lead to connect that to the first point that I made is that we sometimes spend so much time being afraid of being empathetic. We are afraid of being kind and 
and and and and and loving to our colleagues because we think it will be defined as soft, will be defined as easy. Um, and I think it's important for us to recognize that there's actually a huge difference between being empathetic and caring and being a step over. Those things are very, very different. You can be firm as a leader, you can be, um, you know, create a sense of assurance, but you can also be a leader that people can find approachable. Um, those things don't have to be uh, mutually exclusive as, as, as we like to think. So for me, I think women do that relative. I think we have that within us. Um, and it's one thing that we need to leverage more, um, especially now in this time of COVID, where there's so much uncertainty, where people feel afraid. They don't know what's going to happen the next day. If you have a leader that is approachable, that is empathetic, that understands that the world just does not evolve around delivering data and delivering numbers all the time, you will be successful because at the end of this, you will have a, a staff complement that feels empowered, that feels loyal um, in a world where loyalty is lacking. People will come back to you, not because you're paying them a lot of money, but because they know that when I was going through a tough time with my children, with schooling, with uh, connection, you know, um, and, and, and all other things that we're facing right now, my boss was able to say, you know what, you can take the afternoon off. It's okay. I will make sure that somebody else does this or this can wait. Um, and you'll be very surprised at what your employees give back to you. For me, that has been one of the things that I think I find useful. And I think as women, we need to leverage that sense of empathy, that sense of kindness a lot more. Um, because it's more innate to us than it is perhaps to men um, without being fearful, without feeling like we're being, um, you know, short selling ourselves or that we're being demure. It is a strength and being empathetic is a strength and we need to leverage on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. From my perspective and what I've been able to pick, um, I think transformational leadership is um, many different things um, from from what Charles said to purpose-driven. Uh, there's also knowing yourself, having ownership. So what Joanna was emphasizing to us about, you know, watering your own lawn. Uh, what Lindy said to us about bring your true self to the office and the importance of having empathy. And then there's courage. Um, and Sylvia, to your point of you really need to know yourself and be able to fill your own cup. So transformational leadership isn't just one thing. It looks like it's a combination of many different things. And from this particular session that we've had, I really hope that you've been able to draw out some insights for your own leadership journey. I think uh, the panel was able to show us what were the things that were important to them. I thank you so much for being with us. It is such a pleasure to have uh, hosted this session with you. Um, I think it's a very engaging time to be able to talk about transformational leadership at this time and of course as we look into the next decade. Uh, thank you to the panelists and I wish the audience and our guests a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you very much.